It's good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and for being patient while we uh, clipped everyone up so that we could have some seamless transitions um, throughout the day. We have a really exciting and packed schedule planned, and we're really glad that you could uh, join us today for the first open and shut event. Uh, we're really excited about building this community, and for us today is as much about the participants as it is about the speakers and panelists. Um, and we're really looking forward as well in the afternoon to having um, roundtable discussions where we can share ideas and experiences uh, and contribute to the growth of this open and shut community of open data in closed societies. Um, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. There aren't any fire drills planned for today, so if you hear an alarm, it is the real thing. Uh, just gather, or actually I suppose you're supposed to leave your belongings, but probably just gather them quickly and go. <laughs> um, there's a fire exit that way and also the main entrance that you came in by. Uh, the assembly point is the small garden or the garden area out the front uh, where you will have entered the main door. Um, the toilets are this way out by the registration table just before the double doors. Um, and we have some quite reasonable half-hour tea breaks where we can all meet and discuss. Uh, we have a small balcony area out here where you, you can feel free to take coffee and tea uh, and also at lunchtime uh, we can assemble out there and, and have conversations. Um, firstly, I'm going to invite two pivotal people to introduce themselves and also what we're doing today. The first will be Mahmoud, who's the director of small media, um, and then we'll have Caitlin, uh, who's the director of School of Data and a representative of Open Knowledge International, who are our conference partner today. Um, but first I'm going to invite Mahmoud, uh, the director of small media and a close colleague of mine, to talk a little bit about the history of open, uh, Iran open data um, and introduce a little bit more of the concept of our community. Uh, okay, all right, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm uh, very excited to be here and uh, sort of, I would say that, uh, present you um, some of the conversation that we had at Small Media uh, for, for some time uh, about open data and closed society. Um, what I want to do in this very uh, brief session is to share some of our internal conversation, dilemmas, questions, uh, and I think that's what brings us all here is to really look at the, the open data in closed society. And what I want to do in this session is to sort of deconstruct that open data in closed society, look at these closed society data and open in that order, and just share some of the questions that we had and uh, some of the things, the thinking process. But before doing that, just very briefly about the small media uh, and also uh, about uh, um, the how we came up uh, with, the, with the open and shut uh, uh, gathering um, and, and the concept. So at the small media, we provide digital advocacy support to civil society. We work with uh, civil society, with uh, uh, human rights organizations, with activists in different countries. We uh, help them to uh, use uh, technology, uh, digital tools for advocacy purposes. Uh, one of those elements is uh, we rely heavily on data, helping them to uh, collect better data, to analyze data, to make sense of it and present it for advocacy purposes. And part of that uh, was uh, we, we have a couple of other programs, uh, Data for Change, uh, that we, it's a program that we, we have been running for a few years uh, that focuses on mostly the data presentation uh, and basic advocacy. But one of the things, uh, and a bit of a history about the small media, we started as focusing on Iran, and then we gradually uh, got involved with, uh, with the other, other places. But the, uh, what looking at Iran was, uh, for us, was be, be being part of a, I would say, global community of civil society and technology, we were exposed to open data. We knew there was open data movement out there. It is happening. Uh, and we said, okay, how we can use open data in the context of Iran? Because if you look at Iran, uh, there are you know, a lot of data sets, ev literally every uh, government ministry in every sort of agency you go, government agency you go, there is a data set there. Uh, and then we started, you know, a project uh, which there would be a presentation on it later on by my colleague Shukuf on Iran, you know, on Iran Open Data. But then we tried to sort of, uh, so there was this global conversation around open data and we were doing the Iran Open Data. 
and say, actually, is what we're doing, is it open data? What, is, is it really, you know, um, so what, what is it? I mean, what was sort of, the, the, because the, we don't have all the necessary ingredients of this global conversation that is happening around open data. So that's, uh, that sort of came to the, 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 the concept of the open data in closed society. So the first thing I want to talk about is actually what do you mean by, uh, by uh, uh, closed society? And I had that problem before because I've used closed society, called Iran closed society, called other countries, and I have been challenged in, in academic circles, say, oh, Iran is not closed, or, you know, and you have this sort of a variety of um, uh, descriptions about, you know, the failed, you know, democracies, you know, emerging democracies, I don't know, failed states, there are different ways you can describe actually what, what a country is. So I thought actually for the benefit of the conversation here, uh, we use uh, open government partnership definition. So some of you might know open government <coughs> partnership is an uh, international multilateral um, uh, basically platform that tries to get commitments from governments to uh, embrace uh, the openness, transparency, and support the, uh, the citizens. So they have a set of criteria uh, that they look at the countries and say whether the countries are eligible to join um, open government partnership or not. And those are, there are four criteria they look at. One is that whether the, a country has budget, budgetary transparency, whether they basically, you know, they have an open process about how they do budgeting, they publish the budget in fullness, uh, and what is basically, uh, whether it's an open budget or not. Uh, and for that, they look at uh, an open budget index that's maintained by another organization. So the one is access to information. Here they look at more of a freedom of information laws, basically the whole legal framework, uh, legal framework around access to information. And whether there is a uh, legal framework in place, is it practice or not? And for that, basically they are uh, measuring, looking at the index or database by right to info. Uh, then there's another one is asset disclosure. Here's basically public officials' asset disclosure, whether the country basically tells what you know, the salary of the prime minister is, salary of the ministers are, you know, what assets they have, that's sort of a basically index. And the fourth one, it's a citizen engagement, and that's an interesting one because they're using Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index, and that's a composite of many different other rights, basically, uh, uh, freedom to association, freedom of speech, so that's a composite basic index. So they look at this and they score countries. Uh, can you go sorry, to the next one? So what they have done, so these are basically the countries, the blue countries are the countries that are eligible, and they are, sorry, they, they, are, they are eligible and also the participating, they are participating members of Open Government Partnership. So, and the, all the countries that actually, there are the choice of a color black is basically black, is, is that actually they are, they are not eligible to be part of the open um, government partnership. So basically these are the countries that in our, at least sort of one of my solution would be that when I, we, in the context of open data, when we talk about closed society, that's what we mean. Basically countries who are currently not eligible to be part of open government partnership. So that's one sort of suggestion I have is that actually whether that definition works or not, I think it, is, but it needs to be a conversation around what do we mean by open, by, by closed society in the context of open data. Uh, the other part is actually the data itself. What do you mean by data? Uh, I think one of the things is that it, it, when I mentioned this whole global conversation around open data, it, its assumption is that there's a lot of data sets that are produced by the government. But then the problem is when you go to somewhere that actually the government is not producing data set. Or actually, it does every possible way to make it harder for you to use that data set. But then what do you do? What, what are the data sets out there? And I think here at the small media, we actually been start thinking about it, you know, there is a point that even if the government produces the data mm -hmm. and puts it perfect format for you out there, there is a whole universe of unstructured data out there that actually can help open data. And here we're looking at basically anything from you know, the audio, visual, audio video, visual material, you know, satellite imagery, crowdsource data, you know, uh, the latest sort of internet of things, sort of sensor data, anything basically, any other data source that is out there it is not in a beautiful format sort of table, but, but, what, but that's basically where, um, in terms of the data, that's what we mean. So it's beyond, so that was something that for us was that in the context of you know, a lot of these countries, the data needs to also be, the definition of data needs to be changed. And another element of it is also what we found is that there is a data, I mean all of you know there's data, there is information, there is basic knowledge, but also there is, there is a sort of action. There is a sort of what actually, to what extent do you need to go beyond data? Because you have the data set, 
but also is that where you stop? Uh, do you care about actually what sort of information you generate from the data? What, what sort of knowledge you generate from data? And what sort of action you do with that? And lastly, the, not the concept of the, uh, there is the concept of open um, one. I just go to the next one, sorry. Uh, and here is that actually, what do you mean by openness? Because openness in, in a very sort of classical definition of open data is that a data that it can be machine readable, you know, accessible, but is that really what open means? You know, what about the entire process of actually the, the, the open data? And this is actually research was done uh, by Transparency and Accountability Initiative and Open Data Charter was published in May. They, uh, the title of it is Mapping of Open Data for Accountability Purposes. And what they are basically suggesting is that rather than just only focusing on data production, which is basically that part, the openness should go all the full sort of a spectrum to the, the end of it. For instance, when you are sharing your data, how do you share data? What sort of a, you know, the platform to use that? Is that platform inclusive you know, about accessibility of it? Uh, the data processing side, do you disclose actually how you have pr processed this data? Is that part is open? About the action, so all that entire process basically. So that's for us is that these are the con conversation that we feel that they sh many of these questions are shared with, uh, with open data, we say the global conversations, but they, all of them, they have different meanings, different implications when it comes to the concept of uh, closed society. And I think what you hear in, um, in, in, a, in a presentation, especially in the panels, if we are going back to these questions, you will hear some of these challenges. And, uh, and the aim of actually for us why small media is doing this, and also as you know, the Roman mentioned that we think um, this is a community. You guys are basically the, f the first, I would say, members of the, this community. And that what we would like this community to do is to define, sort of continue this conversation, actually, what does open data mean in closed society? Because as we see, there are a lot of countries that would fit in that conversation. And what are the challenges? And there are a lot of experience in this room. You will see in the panelists that we're going to share that sort of experiences, challenges. So that's, um, that's from me. I'm looking forward to the panels. And Kathleen, sorry. You yeah, no, you can, you can <laughs> hand over seeing as you're, you're standing right next to each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, is my mic on? Yes, OK. Um, so, so yeah, I should have prepared slides. I have slides for a, a later <laughs> talk. Now I feel uh, uh, slightly underprepared. So uh, my name is Caitlin Rogers. Um, I work for an organization called Open Knowledge International. Uh, we were founded in 2004. Um, we were actually called Open Knowledge Foundation at the time. And sometimes I still use Open Knowledge Foundation. <laughs> uh, so we were founded in 2004 and have in Cambridge mm, and have really been story. pushing since the beginning for um, access to information and data, both with governments and other institutions. So what I'm going to talk about today is primarily kind of the work um, and the thinking of open data and open government data in particular, but I think that this conversation needs to also be broader and we need to think about other powerful institutions and the rights that we have to access their data and information as well. It's, but today, we're going to primarily focus on open government data. So, so when we talk about open government, when we talk about open government data and open data in general, it really has like the open data movement has its roots in two different communities that are both, I would say, are equally important in how we kind of came to where we are now. Um, the first community is the free and open source software movement. And that's where we talk about a lot of the technical aspects of open data, but also in the right to information movement. And that's what I'm going to focus on today, because I think that's really where we can draw some connections on some of the challenges we're going to have in doing open data um, in contexts where we don't necessarily have the right to information. So in the, in the kind of 90s and early 2000s, we saw this massive expansion in right to information legislation kind of across, across Europe. and. Uh, Latin America and many countries. Um, before that, it was kind of like there was just a few countries that had right to information legislation. And this is the result of like massive amounts of organizing and an international community that was making the arguments to governments that we had this right to access their information. Um, so then when we started talking about, you know, we had more technology and we could really start using government data it was much easier from there to make an argument to a government that, okay, you already have, we already have this right to access information and I can file a freedom of information request and you are required to provide this information for me. Maybe we can simplify this process and you can proactively provide this information 
for me so we don't have to have this kind of you know back and forth and argument so it's really interesting in the US there was um, so I've submitted I'm originally from the States I have submitted countless <laughs> freedom of information requests to the US government various agencies it can be such a pain and you really kind of have to go back and forth with them they redact the most ridiculous things sometimes and there was it was really interesting because this created this kind of tension often um, so it's great that we have this information it's it's incredibly important that we don't forget that it is a right um, and that like open data is founded upon that right to information but when we when I would request information from governments there was always this kind of instinct from the public administration to try to find a reason not to give it to me because there's all these exceptions and stuff like that so there was you created this kind of tension and then by going to government saying why don't you proactively provide this this is not necessarily information you don't have something to hide here this is like a lot of this is just kind of like a byproduct of the public administration you don't have something to hide and it was like fascinating to find when we made that argument to governments there was often this like oh okay yeah sure no okay we'll provide it and so there was this there were like data sets that like people had been kind of trying to get out of government for years that like then they were like, oh, yeah, no, we're going to do like this open data thing and we're going to publish it transparently and it's like fine. So there was this like interesting kind of shift in kind of we're going to ask governments and try to cooperate with them and see if they will just provide this information proactively. Um, then we discovered something else. So in like 2009, I think, there's this like famous Tim Berners Lee TED talk where he gets people to like chant like like raw data now or something is like the the line who's like people are like chanting that um, so this was our argument we want raw data from governments um, then we discovered when they provided us with this raw data that the data quality was terrible <laughs> um, so that's when so we're kind of at this place now where we have to think about and again that's kind of back to that um, transparency and accountability that like t um, like graphic that you had we're, we're really talking now about like the data production and the data publication and we realized that like the data publication or production from governments it's like there was lots of inaccuracies the spreadsheets were a mess they were never necessarily created and generated for us to have access to them because they're the most government data is produced you know in the like as a byproduct again of kind of administrating this massive institution um, so so that again we really have to think about like how we're working with governments at the production phase to ensure that kind of the production of data when it's released it's of better quality and stuff like that so there's a lot of interesting things happening there um, so but again so all of this in kind of the countries that I have primarily worked in like often they have the right to information they're often these OGP countries that have this kind of that meet these like really baseline eligibility criteria I think we can argue and like a lot of these countries how functional the right to information legislation is is another question but at least they, they've acknowledged this right and you're kind of you can in certain senses push against a door that is you know a jar let's say it's you know like you're pushing against an open door um, so what does that mean when we start working in countries where like this this right has not been established because there's it's more than just you know the government acknowledging it there's that community that feels that they have this right they are allowed to ask the government for this information and the government has to respond to them now again how, how functional that is it depends on the country it depends often on the the whatever institution you're asking for like in the US the Department of De Defense not super nice about re responding to freedom of information requests um, so I think so the Open Knowledge Foundation and another organization in the World Wide Web Foundation, they, every year we do this, um, we do a, like an assessment of open data around the world. So in Open Knowledge's uh, index is called the Global Open Data Index and the Web Foundation has something called the Open Data Barometer. Um, they're slightly different, I won't get into all the like, differences. But one of the things that we do see every year is like, so this year there was very few countries represented it from Central Africa, the MENA region, or like Central Asia. And the way we do the Global Open Data Index is we ask local communities to assess their own government. 
we don't want to hire people. I, like I could technically probably go in and, and look and see if this data is open and do the assessment, but then I have the knowledge about where this data is and whether it's open, not the local community who should be using it. So this year, like so for the last four years, we've really tried to find communities that can do this assessment. And this year we did make a push, but we also kind of but in the past we would be like, okay, if we can't find something, we'll just submit the information ourselves. And this year we made a choice not to do that. And really what came out is we see on the index that we were not able to find people in these in these countries that were going to submit to the index themselves. So that to me indicates that we really have to do a lot of work around community building. So finding the people locally, getting an understanding of the things that they want to work on, the places that they see there might be an opening to work with the government. This might be mean rather than working with the national government, maybe you can work with local government authorities. Maybe at the local government authority level, there's more of an opportunity to kind of collaborate and things like that. So we have, but all of that really has to be driven from a local community, like an international organization can't go in and say, this is the data that we should be publishing because we've said that it's, it's the most important data and therefore can you please make it available. That just like, it won't be sustainable. There needs to be a push from a local community to ensure that that data is kind of coming out every year. Um, I think when the open data movement kind of, it really, I, I started working on this around 2011 and like in that time, we've really seen kind of a, a boom and then a bit of a bust. Um, there was this massive expansion of open data portals. Everyone was like being like, okay, like the World Bank was financing like these governments to get their open data portal and they build this portal, but they don't have any of the infrastructure behind it to be getting the, gov the data out of the government agencies, publish publishing it on this central, um, centralized database. And then there's this no community of, out there to actually use the data. So there's so many points along this kind of, this chain, this assumption that like, okay, the governments are, they have this data, they're gonna publish it, then like this math, like these magical people are gonna come and they're gonna use it and they're gonna build these apps and it's gonna be really awesome. Um, and so we've seen like a lot of these governments that did make this investment to try to publish this data then you know, with time they got a little bit, you know, it does cost money. I think we also, there's, there's an incredible amount of kind of economic opportunity that can be built off the back of this data, but you also have to remember it costs money for the governments to invest in this data publication. And if people aren't using it, they're going to be like, well, I mean, see, like you, no one's using the data. Why should we continue to invest in this infrastructure? Um, so I think that there's been less, I mean, data portals and centralized publications is incredibly important, but there's now a little bit, the open data movement after this kind of bust and we're like, all right, maybe this is not the best way to push for this, has kind of now been thinking about how do we work with governments to streamline the process of data publication. So to build from, from the data production to the publication, there's like streamlined systems that make it much easier. The data is more standardized and that facilitates use. So that means working it a little bit slower. So it's not just saying like, okay, whatever data sets you have, just throw them out there and something will be used. We kind of really have to work with governments from the beginning. And I think that's where there's this like an opportunity in these in quote unquote closed societies is finding, you know, finding data or, or governments, again, it could be local government, national government that have like an interest already in publishing some kind of data or improving their data quality. Um, a colleague of mine was recently uh, working on a project in uh, Central Asia. So he, he's hired to go over there and to kind of assess this project and lead a workshop. And he flies over there and he lands and the person who picks him up from the airport is like, thank you so much for coming, we're really excited to have you. Um, so we can't have the workshop because it hasn't been approved by the president's office. So he's like, okay, I mean, I've been traveling for 24 hours, what am I doing here? And they, the government didn't say you couldn't have the workshop, they just never got back to them. So now the civil servants who are supposed to come to this workshop are not allowed to come to the workshop, and so he's there and he's like, all right, what are we gonna do for three days? Like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, and so he's like meeting with the people from the UNDP who are hosting him, and they said, okay, well, we can like maybe go and have some meetings with these with 
representatives from the local government authority. I for, I, it's Tajikistan, and I forget the name of the what they called kind of the local government authorities. And so he's like, okay, that's great. And so he goes and then he talks to these people, and they're like, yes. Yeah, so what we really want to do is we have we have this data kind of about like how many people are in school, like just like basic kind of demographic data of the, the different regions. But right now we're collecting it in on paper. And so they bring out this like book where they're just like somebody from, there's just one person in each local government authority that just kind of collects this data by hand. And the data is just wrong. Like every, nothing adds up to 100. Like it's just like, it is a mess. And he's like, and so they're like, okay, well, what are the other problems? And they're like, well, I mean, firstly, we can't publish this data because A, it's wrong, and B, it's on paper. And he's like, yeah, that's a problem. Um, and they're like, and also, we really can't have any system that's like online because like most of the time we don't have access to the internet. Like most of the time the internet's not working. And he's like, okay, those are some problems. <laughs> but what he, the opportunity they had is now the project, the idea behind the project is that they can build a system that works offline that can, that they can do like the data input on an offline system that will produce the data sets in a like systematic, clean way. It will check to make sure that like the number of girls and the number of boys isn't more than the number of people at the school, because the computer can like, kind of make sure those numbers add up. And so like, is this project going to like fundamentally change Pakistan? Probably not. But it is like an open door because the government sees an opportunity to streamline a process and civil society can then maybe use this data. We'll have better data about who's going to school and things like that. And from there, we can kind of start building. So I think that those are like really focusing on local communities and what they want, and then finding the moments where like we can help governments like streamline their data production and processing. And from there, hopefully in time, we can get them to be publishing more data and see the value of it. But like really kind of, it's baby steps.